Hiscop TV. Hello well, there, you are welcome to Hiscop TV. And my name is colleagues Nanaya Ababrese, a government and history uh, tutor. Uh, in this uh, lesson, we are going to take a look at the non-aligned movement, also known as the NAM. Okay, so if you hear me say NAM, NAM, I'm referring to the non-aligned uh, movement. Now, we shall take a look at the background of the NAM, the history or short uh, history uh, behind the ham, uh, NAM, so that we can be able to understand their activities. And then we will also take a look at the reasons uh, for the formation of the NAM. So what led to the formation of the NAM? And then we also take a look at the achievements of the NAM. And then the last one will be the problems or the limitations of NAM. And so these are going to be our, our lesson objectives as we uh, move on in our, our discussions. But before we even begin with our discussion with our lesson objectives, I would like to remind you uh, to subscribe to our channel if you have not done so. And if you have already subscribed, we thank you very much for your uh, support. If you are inclined to learning history, uh, government, um, CRS, uh, and even uh, attracted to uh, culture-wise, you know, you can uh, click in the uh, on the subscribe uh, button. Share our link with your friends who may also be interested. Now, let's begin our lesson with our lesson objectives. So, our first objective for today or for this lesson uh, would be that by the end of this lesson, you should be able to highlight the factors or reasons uh, that led to the formation of the NAM. Some of the factors that led to the formation of the NAM, you should be able to do that. And then also outline the achievements of the NAM. What are some of the achievements of the NAM? You should also be able to uh, do that for us. And then also highlight the challenges or the problems associated with NAM or some of the problems of the NAM. There is no organization uh, without uh, problems. And so what are some of the uh, problems that uh, NAM or faces. And so these are going to be our objectives, our lesson objectives, and these objectives are going to guide us as we move on uh, with our discussions for uh, today. So let's begin with the background of NAM because before we can be able to understand uh, the activities of NAM or the non-aligned movement, we should be able to uh, know the history uh, behind the NAM before we can be able to understand their activities. So what is NAM? Now the NAM is an, uh, is an international organization of states which are formally not aligned. Now take, a, uh, or take notice of this, not aligned, which are formally not aligned with either the Western Bloc, which is USA, or the Eastern Bloc which is the Union Soviet of Socialist uh, Republic, the USSR, during the Cold War era. Now, I would explain all this as we move on in our discussion. But bear in mind that the non-aligned movement, even the name itself, non-aligned movement, simply means that they were not, or they did not align themselves with any of the superpowers or any of the blocs. Today, if I ask you the superpowers or the most powerful countries in this world, I hope you will be able to tell me some of them, which I know you have. Some of them is still the USA, of course, Russia, we have China, even India. All these are countries are, you know, emerging as superpowers. But of course, undoubtedly, we have the USA and, uh, of course, Russia. So, like I said, I'll explain these terms as we move on. So you let's move on. I'll come back with the explanation of the uh, definition. So let's take a look at more about the NAM. Now, 188 members form the NAM, and these members are mostly uh, developing countries. Um, developing countries, right? Ghana, you know, Indonesia, those uh, developing countries, for countries that are not well developed. They came together to form the NAM, and their members were 188. Now, these countries made NAM as part of their foreign policy. Every country has uh, policies regarding how they relate with international or other countries. And these are what we termed as what foreign policies. How these countries uh, relate with uh, other or countries. And so, they made it part of their foreign policy to not align. 
Now, why was it so that these uh, developing countries, 181, decided not to align with any of these superpowers? And by the way, how did these superpowers even came about for, uh, I mean, for countries to choose between them, either to align or not to align? Align simply means to support or not to support them. Let's take a look at the history behind it. Now, after the Second World War or the World War II, the world was divided on the basis of ideologies. So after the Second World War, around 1945, the world was divided uh, into ideologies. Two uh, major economic ideologies emerged in the world as at, after the Second World War. Now, so what were these two ideologies? The first ideology was a capitalist ideology. And this capitalist ideology was uh, supported by the West. So the West, which means uh, Europe, of course, Western Europe. They supported the capitalist ideology. That's why we call it capitalist West. Mostly, of course, Western Europe, Britain, you know, uh, of course, France, uh, Germany, and co. Now, some of the countries that supported this ideology was the USA, of course, Britain, Canada, uh, of course, Germany, and co. These were the capitalists. Now, when we talk of capitalists, what do you mean by capitalists? Well, capitalism has to do with uh, private participation in the production of goods and what and services. So, in simple terms, what these countries stood for economically was that they encouraged uh, private people to actually, uh, you know, get involved in the production of goods and services, which then means that they encourage uh, private people to set up industries to open up jobs for the uh, citizens to do okay and that is what the capitalism is all about private participation now this ideology was counted with a socialist east i mean socialism this ideology was also of course supported by the ussr which we have them here the union of soviet uh, so, uh, the union of soviet socialist republic now we, we call them Russia. Now, this capitalist ideology was, um, you know, it was, it was counted with this, this, I mean, socialist ideology. We call them socialist East because they also are found in the Eastern Europe. So we know that Russia is found in the Eastern part of Europe. So they are the Eastern Europe. They also stress on the fact that when individuals, you know, um, um, when I mean, when the production of goods and services are in the hands of the individual, what happens is that the individual becomes, you know, richer. I mean, the capitalists, those who uh, establish the the I mean, the industries, they become uh, richer at the expense of the working masses. All right. So some people will work for you, individual, and make you more richer, and you just give the person a little, you know. Uh, monthly for salary. And so this Eastern Europe, I mean Russia, also propounded a theory also known as the socialist uh, theory, which also says that no, we will not allow individuals to set up, you know, industries to hold on to the means of production. However, the country or the government is supposed to be in charge of what the, uh, the production of goods and services. So which means that the government is going to take an active role in the production of goods and services and set up industries, open up jobs for people to, work, to, be, to, 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 to work in these jobs. And then the profits that will come out from these jobs are going to be distributed fairly to all citizens for them to enjoy the benefit of their work. However, when you look at the capitalist, what happens is that the profit always goes to that one person who established the industry called the capitalist, that one person. So these two ideologies emerged after the Second World War. And therefore, what then happened was that these developing countries were forced to take sides. Now, these two attempted to influence the weaker our countries with their ideologies to win them into their favor. So these two ideologies, the capitalist and the socialist, I, I hope now you understand the capitalist and then the socialist. These two ideologies were fighting for acceptance from the developing countries. Let me use Ghana for example. Now, 
these countries may want or may want Ghana to buy into their idea. Why? Because they know that they have to come and invest here in Ghana. Let me tell you this. The capitalists, for instance, they would want to encourage or they would want Ghana to you know, align with them or to support them so that when Ghana decides to say, I am a capitalist country or a capitalist nation, what that means is that Ghana is going to encourage private participation in the, in the production of goods and, what, and services. So what that implied is that Ghana would obviously uh, welcome uh, foreign investors. And so these foreign investors from this capitalist world, they have money, so they will come into Ghana, establish industries in Ghana, uh, you know, hire some few Ghanaians to work in these industries. Then I don't really, the profit that they will make from the, of course, the work in Ghana or the industry in Ghana or the productions in Ghana, they will repatriate all this profit back to their homeland, say, I mean, Britain or the U.S., which means that more money is going to be pumping into the U.S. by these or capitalists. You get a point. However, when Ghana also decides to be a socialist, uh, uh, you know, a socialist country, what that means is that Ghana is going to limit our private participation in all fields of the economy, in all sectors. So mining, you know, uh, banking, whatsoever, and construction, all these things are going to be done by the state. So the state would establish banking, they will, I mean, they will establish a bank, they will establish industries, they will establish, you know, they will be in control of the gold, whatever. So, if Ghana decides to be a socialist country, so what that means is that Ghana would invite, of course, Russia to come in to help them, or I mean, to help the country to open up state-owned enterprises, okay, managed and run by the state. And then the profit in these areas will be distributed fairly to the people. So, so what Russia you know, stands to gain is that, yeah, they will come into an agreement with you, Ghana, that this is what we are going to do for you. And they will also take up concessions. Okay, so mining concession, or, or like what not, what not. You get a point? Yes, I don't know if you understand, uh, if you get the point I'm trying to make. So these two ideologies were actually are fighting or uh, they were uh, or fighting for influence, you know, on these, uh, uh, on these of course countries, because it all comes with benefit. Now these numb countries then decided not to be part of the Cold War. The Cold War here simply meant the ideologies, the two emerging ideologies fighting. So let the people, you know, uh, establish their own industries. No. Let the government establish the industry and employ them. These two ideologies were actually, is what we call the Cold War. It did not actually happen. That's why it's called Cold War. It's not a war that happened between like physical or shooting and whatnot, but, uh, you know, ideological influence. Okay. And so some countries chose to align with the West and the East. I mean, Cuba, for instance, uh, chose to align with the East. Now, the problem is that when you choose to align with the West or the East, that's the capitalist or the socialist, what happens is that if, for instance, Ghana decides to align with the West, we become antagonized by the East, which means that, I mean, Russia is not going to see us as their friends. You get the point? When Ghana also decides to uh, support or align with the uh, East or Russia, the capitalist or the West, we are also going to be antagonized. I mean, Ghana is going to be antagonized by the West. The West is also going to see us as, what, as, as, as an enemy. You know, and most often these uh, countries even back, I mean, political uh, leaders in these uh, countries to actually come and win or to win election, to come into power so that they, they give out uh, their for concessions and align with them. So the, 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 the issue was that if you are a developing country and you decide to align with one, it means that you are forced to trade or have a diplomatic relations with only the East if, in case you align with the East. It means that Russia is not going to be in support of anything that you do. And that, to some of the work, uh, to, the, uh, to the developing countries, was not, you know, all that good. So they decided not to align, but to be neutral. 
And neutral here means that I can deal with the west and I can also deal with the east. If I need something and I want to go to the west, I can go to the west for it. If I need something and I want to go to the east, I can also deal with the east. So they decided to be what? Neutral in their uh, 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 in their as for foreign policy. So I, 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 know, I know the economic students would understand this so well, this capitalism and socialism. Now, the non-aligned movement was uh, founded in September 1961 at Belgrade in uh, Yugoslavia. And that's where the non-aligned movement was formed. They decided we will not take I mean, sides, size, we will be neutral, we will deal with each of them. Now, l let's take a look at some of the examples, uh, the, I mean, the founders, those who are proposed that let us not join any of them, let's deal with them or be neutral. Prez Gamal al Nasser of Egypt was instrumental. Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana was also instrumental. And then President uh, Joseph Bros Tito, he was also very instrumental. And then also President uh, Sukarno was also very instrumental of Indonesia. And I believe I'll, I'll be showing pictures of these, uh, you know, uh, people, and you, you, you might see them. So Gamal of Nassau, uh, uh, for President Gamal and Nassau of Egypt, uh, Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana, uh, Joseph Bronze uh, Tito, and then also uh, President uh, Sukarno of Indonesia. These people were instrumental in the NAM. Now let's take a look at why the NAM was formed, so the reasons for the, the formation of the NAM. In simple terms, decolonization. One reason was decolonization. The NAM was formed in order to eliminate all forms of what, uh, colonization, new uh, colonization, and all forms of foreign domination. They didn't want their countries to be dominated by uh, foreigners, and so they decided to form the NAM, and more so to also aid other uh, countries that were under the colonial rule to be actually were liberated. Okay, so that was the first reason. The next reason for the formation of the NAM was power struggle between the two uh, blocks. Now, NAM was formed for the founding fathers to take a stand in order not to associate themselves with the two powerful blocks. Now, you know, we have already indicated that because of the Cold War, uh, these uh, you know, like Western and European countries were fighting for what influence. So the NAM was actually formed because of that power struggle between the West and then the East, you know, for, for countries to align with them. And so that was a reason why the NAM was formed, just to take a decision as to not to align with any of them. Again, insecurity within the weaker core countries also was a reason for the formation of NAM. The quest for military and superiority sorry, between the factions in the Cold War led to the manufacturing of arms and weapons of mass destruction. Now, these developing countries felt insecure because at the time of the Cold War, these uh, superpowers were actually manufacturing weapons of mass destruction and so on and so forth. So, I mean, nuclear powers and so on. So these developing countries, I mean, uh, uh, they, they, they were insecure, okay? They felt insecure, and therefore, they didn't have the power to also manufacture these items, uh, these heavy, heavy machines. So they didn't want to then take any size to be in trouble, because if two elephants are fighting, if I don't take size, I don't think they will come in and, and attack me. So because of insecurity within the weaker states, they also had to come together and form the, the non-aligned movement and say to the world that we are not aligned with any party or any uh, block. Also for economic assistance, and this was one major important uh, reason for the formation of the uh, NAM. Members of NAM needed economic assistance to aid uh, development activities after the attainment of what? Independence. Now you see these developing countries came up as independent countries. And they were they needed foreign investment and foreign aid, you know, to aid in their development. And so, if you align with one, and uh, maybe you, for instance, you align with the Eastern Bloc, and the Eastern Bloc disappoints you, you can't go to the Western Bloc because formally you have made it known that you belong to the Eastern Bloc. So, in order for them to gain or get 
economic assistance, they decided not to align with any, any of them and make it part of their foreign uh, policy. But let's take a look at the achievement of NAM. Were they able to, I mean, have they been able to achieve certain success? The NAM succeeded in, in standing against any form of colonization, neo colonialism, and all forms of what are uh, foreign domination. So they were able to liberate some uh, for countries. They also stood against neo colonialism and foreign domination of their kingdom, uh, of their state, because they dealt with you know each of these uh, blocks. Now the NAM movement has always been opposed to the division of the world into capitalist and socialist bloc by the associating themselves from them. So, you know, one achievement here is that they have stated to the world that indeed we don't, we don't want a situation where the world is divided into two blocks, the capitalist and then the socialist. No, we should all be together, come together and work together. And they have times with our numbers, you know, stated that and I think they have achieved that. Now, the NAM has served as a mouthpiece for developing uh, countries to effectively share their concerns on important uh, global issues. Yes, so if there is something going on between the West and the East, and today they are still doing it, the West and the East, I mean USA and Russia are at each other, trade wars and all of that. So NAM is able to come up, if there is any issues between the two of them, NAM is able to come up with their own stance because they are not you know, uh, uh, supporting or aligning with any of them so they can be uh, neutral and say issues, say to issues as they are. Now, the NAM also condemned outright apartheid policy in South Africa and always supported sanctions against South Africa. So uh, during the apartheid system, the discrimination in South Africa uh, during the colonial uh, period, NAM stood in support of the majority are uh, South Africans who were demanding for uh, independence or democracy, you know, and they supported every sanctions that were uh, levied against uh, uh, minority South Africa. All right, good. So uh, the last one has to do with the NAM has helped member states to secure development assistance from both the Western and the Eastern Bloc without any hindrance because these uh, members did not. Uh, state it clearly which block they belong to. Uh, they were able to secure, uh, I mean, a financial assistance from these two countries. Even though, for, um, for instance, Ghana, we say, became a socialist uh, country at a point, took a stand to support, of course, Russia or align with Russia some way, somehow. Nkrumah also managed to secure some, you know, uh, of course, some funding from the U.S., especially for the building of the Aminakosomo Dam from uh, a U.S. Uh, company, Kaiser. So they were able to deal with the two, uh, uh, you know, two blocks. For whereas if you align with one, you can't deal with these two blocks. But let's take a look at the last one, the limitations or problems of the NAM, and then we'll bring our discussions to an end. Lack of proper direction. Um, NAM, as an, as an organization, has no proper direction as to where they want to take their members to. You know, it's all about don't align with each of them. We don't align with each of them, but there hasn't been any proper direction for NAM to go as to it being the ultimate goal of all our members, okay? The next one also, lack of military establishment. NAM actually does not have a standing army for itself whereby they are able to, you know, use the military to enforce uh, some of their resolutions and agreements and conventions. NAM lack military establishment. They don't have any standing army for that. For financial difficulties, it's also a problem of NAM. Uh, I believe they also lack for the finances to, to, to implement some of the uh, resolutions and, 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 and the conventions that they agree on. Uh, of course, I mean, partly because some of the members actually they don't pay dues and all of that. Some of them, and and that has, of course, uh, partly been that. And then also lack of a uh, permanent secretary or secretariat, sorry, of the NAM. The NAM don't have an office where they 
run the administration of the organization. They lack a permanent uh, secretariat. They don't have an office. And that is a big blow to NAMP. All right? Good. So I think this uh, uh, part we will bring our, our lesson to an end for today. But I have a very nice assignment for you. Look for the members of the NAMP. Okay? Obviously, Ghana is one. And go and check out for some of the members of the NAM or the member states that form the NAM. You can share that in the comment section when you get them. And also try your hand on this work as you see on your screen. Uh, the members are, are, are mostly from Asia and Africa, are mostly the independent or nations. All right? So get some examples of the member states of the NAM and share with me in the comment section. If you have any question, any uh, topic you may want us to take a look at, you can uh, for contact us, go into our uh, page, you'll find our for contact there. Have a nice day and bye-bye.